Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, founder and CEO at RiderFlex. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. And as a reminder, please subscribe to the RiderFlex show for updates on new episodes. And by the way, if you haven't already, check out the book we recently launched, The RiderFlex Guide, Inspiring and Hiring, available for purchase on Amazon. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Try the number one marketing platform for small business. Everything you need from design to marketing to CRM. Learn more at marketing360.com. Marketing 360. Fuel your brand. Luis Escobar on the RiderFlex podcast. How you doing, Luis? I am great. Thanks for having me here, uh, Steve. It's a real honor and a, and a privilege. And just thanks for having me on the show. You bet. Now, are you in California? I am in Cool, California. That's El Dorado. Yeah, it's the name of the town is Cool. It's in (laughs) El Dorado County. It's on the western side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, about an hour, hour and a half away from uh, North Lake Tahoe. Okay, what's your your temperature? You got a jacket on there, I see. Oh, man, it's a little bit cool this morning, actually, even though we're recording this in the uh, early spring, summer. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit cool out here. I don't know. It's it's morning time, so. Yeah. Isn't it nice to, do you work remotely all the time, 100%? Pretty much, yeah. I do have an office down in Santa Maria, California. And, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a commercial photographer, and I'm also in uh, in an event coordinator. We, we work with trail running events. And so I do some of my photography work is down there in the Santa Maria Valley. And my running events are all across the country. So I can be pretty much anywhere right now. I'm happy to be at home in cool California. You know, I tell you the value, at least for me, this, in my opinion, the value, it's hard to put a value or a dollar amount on how wonderful it is to be able to just open your laptop on your back porch with Mm -hmm. nice, with night, you know, with nice weather and a cup of coffee and, and do work from there. You know, people, always ask me you know what's that worth i'm like man it's hard it's hard to put a number on it i don't know but it, it, it will change your life i know that <laughs> yeah of course the, the ability to you know work pretty much anywhere i am yeah. is wonderful and it's probably one of the one of the reasons why i live you know i'm so happy and i live a great life is yes. because i have kind of patterned everything to where i can be anywhere in the world and sort of set up shop wherever i happen to be you know, about seven years ago now, uh, I was finishing up my last executive position working for other companies before I started RiderFlex. And the whole goal, the entire goal, my wife and I would sit on the back porch, you know, in the afternoon, and I kept telling her, I'm like, I want to create something that we can work remotely from anywhere. And, uh, you know, I want to figure out how to do that. And it took us several years, you know, kind of step by step where I started Rider Flex and we got it going. And then Kim was finally able to quit her job. And then we bought a nicer RV for travel and work remotely. And, but, you know, none of it happened overnight. Like it took time to kind of get there, you know, Sure. Uh, but, but boy, now, just like you said, we're like, we're in this place where it's like, wow, to be able to just work from home today, I'm from my home office, but you know, to be able to work from wherever you want to is a special thing. Uh, I, I highly recommend it for psychological, yeah. emotional, and physical health. It's awesome. Of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm 60 years old, Steve, and, it's, and I've never had a job. I've never uh, worked for somebody else. Uh, uh, my wife and I have been self-employed pretty much our entire lives. Awesome. And one of the things I've learned is that if, if we are happy and comfortable, then our friends and our community and our audience and our customers are also happy and comfortable. No uh, doubt. I am excited to get up every day and get to work. And I think that that excitement and enthusiasm spills over into our audience and our customers. And I could not imagine putting on a necktie and shiny shoes and going into an office and sitting at a desk. I don't know if I could uh I could thrive in that uh environment. You know, you're you're 60 years old and I'll be 56 this summer. Remember when we had to like dress up all the time? Remember when, you know, earlier like earlier in life like people kind of still wore ties and stuff like mm-hmm. I mean, I guess maybe they still do on the East Coast a little bit, but boy, if you're like west of the Mississippi and you have a tie on, 
you kind of look weird, like you're out of place. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I like putting, you know, getting dressed up and putting on a necktie, I guess, for special occasions. Or special whatever. occasions, but, yeah. But for yeah. the most part, yeah, my life, my lifestyle and our business is pretty informal. So you're married then, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. Kids, grandkids, what's the story there? Yeah, so Beverly and I have been together for 40 years. Um, cool. She is, yeah, she's my girl from the beginning till right now. Cool. Cool. We have three kids and uh, three adult children and a uh, and a grandson. And um, yeah, awesome. everybody's doing great. Everything is good. And we're on a up right now. You know, life comes up and down. And <laughs> oh, comes oh in, no doubt. <laughs> it comes in waves. But right now, everybody's happy. Everything's going great. Isn't that so true? Life is exactly like that. It, it will. It's because I, I did a podcast episode on this. Like shit's going to happen. Like shit is going to fly your way. Mm -hmm. it, this is just part of it. Like it, you're going to have a bad month, you know, whatever happens, you know, uh, stuff breaks at the house or I don't know, family member gets anything. Mm -hmm. So you, when oh, it is good, like when, when the times are good, try to enjoy it because, you know, there's a storm around the corner. <laughs> so I'm involved in long distance running that's a big part of my life and it's a big part of our our little business here and one thing that you learn in endurance running is that something is going to happen something is going to go wrong if you're <laughs> going to start a 100 mile endurance run through the mountains you can't say to yourself gosh i hope hope nothing happens today I, you know yeah, you, the attitude has got to be okay when something happens Bingo. What is my response? How am I going to, how am I going to reply to that? And uh, so, you know, your attitude is everything. So just be prepared because it's coming. Like you said, <laughs> the shit sandwich is on the way. How are you going to deal with it when it arrives? I think that's really good life advice too. Uh, the same thing applies to the hobby. My wife and I, uh, we do a lot of, uh, we live in Colorado. So we do a lot of like uh, mountain stuff either with our ATVs or my Jeep or mm -hmm. camping stuff. Same conversation we have. It's like, you know, if we, if you take toys up to the mountains and you like stuff, it, things are going to break. Things mm -hmm. are going to happen. Like, just be ready for it. Like, you know, you're not going to just go on one of those trips and everything's going to go perfect. You know, <laughs> well, that's part of the deal, right? I mean, that's yep. how we grow. And just be aware of those things. You there's you can't just sit back and think it's going to be puppies and unicorns every day. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not going to be. So early in your career, tell us a little bit about. Uh, well, first let me let me go back. Give me a quick mom, dad, siblings, and kind of where you grew up overview, if you don't mind. Yeah, I grew up in a little town in San Luis Obispo County. Okay. It was a little town at the time. It's Atascadero, California. Right yeah. on Highway 101. And my awesome. parents are photographers and artists. Oh. I grew up, our home was my father's portrait studio. So I grew cool. up with customers coming in and out of the house. You know, we our house during business hours became a business. And cool. I yeah. have memories of my father out in the yard doing high school graduation portraits or photographing oh. children or whatever. My mom on the back deck, um, retouching negatives and working in a dark room and just any anything that a small town photographer would do, mm -hmm. my parents did. And so that was the environment that I was around, my sisters and I. And um, for me, it was just a natural progression to, to do that type of work. And so uh, it's exactly what happened. And almost immediately after high school, I met Beverly, my wife, and we did work a little bit, some restaurants at the beginning, and then pretty quickly knew that uh, the photography business is what we needed to do because we had a, mm -hmm. we had a head start, you know, my parents were involved. And so let's get involved. So that was it, Steve, okay. for more than 30 years. Um, that's what I did and continue to do as a profession as a professional photographer, small town portrait photographer. And, and did you work with your parents at all? Did you kind of mm -hmm. like capitalize or get referrals from them? Yeah. At they first. Like, um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I hated it. You know, when I was a, a teenager and, and my dad would make me go with him, put on that necktie and go to a wedding and carry his camera <laughs> cases. And I didn't really like any of that stuff, but um, that's all, it's, it's all I knew. And so when the time came, uh, you know, I was, I was ready to go. I did have a head start because he, that's nice. um, yeah. And then 
we purchased a little photography studio a couple towns away in Santa Maria, California. And that's where Beverly and I moved. And that's where we started our business. Uh, okay. And that's uh -huh. where we uh -huh. raised our children and, and everything was great. And, and the Santa Maria Valley is a beautiful place to be. And it's full of creative, generous, wonderful people. And we had a great time there. Um, and you still operate the business. You and your wife still operate that business. Uh, or, yeah. Or yeah. Kind of. Um, Things have really changed in the photography world, as you might imagine, in the last 20 years, the advent of digital photography and people with their phones and all of that. So the type of work that we used to do is not something that people need anymore. Okay. It's, you know, they can, they can do it. So now our businesses, our photography business is really focused on working with businesses and doing stuff that they doing the type of work that, that, that they, that they need, that they can't do on their own, that they don't want to mess with. They want, you know, give me an example. Like, give me an example. Uh, an example might be, let's see, I do some work for dignity health, which is a, uh, uh, a healthcare company and they okay. manage own and manage hospitals all over the country. Let's say that one of those departments in at a hospital has a new piece of machinery that they want to uh, document. Well, okay. it's, probably less expensive and more efficient to just hire a photographer, a professional that can come in, get the work done right now and uh, no fooling around with it. So they're not in there trying to do it on their own. So I see in, in this case, they need what I can do. Also let's make, make flying a drone. That's not something that everybody can do. It's, it's certainly not something that everybody can do legally. So if they need you know, a mm -hmm. company needs a licensed insured, mm -hmm. uh, drone operator then yep. and I'm the guy so you know things have changed we photography is now for me providing service for people that need what I do not necessarily that want what I do if that makes any sense <laughs> yeah yeah no doubt okay very good so all right is all right sounds and your wife helps you with the business yeah still. she does yeah absolutely so she is definitely um a big part of what we do she's okay. sort of the back end person so Take care of all of our ordering and accounting, bookkeeping, uh, and all I got of that. you. All mm -hmm. right, yeah, that's handy. That's a nice teamwork. Uh, how do you want to direct folks for that uh, website? Contact information. Do you want to advertise that? You want to mention? Yeah, anything? sure, sure. If you have a commercial photography project, um, you can go to reflectionsphotographystudio.com, or just reach out to me directly and i'm sure that we'll put my contact in the show notes for yep. for this yep. podcast but okay yeah right. um just any Great. kind of commercial work I, I can do it for you okay how did you get into the running the long distance running how did mm -hmm. that start like was that early in life were you, were you like a high school track kid guy mm -hmm. like what talk, no talk to me about it. no none of that when i was uh in my early 20s uh I, I really enjoyed playing tennis and okay. I right. thought that if I did some running, I would be in better shape and become a better tennis player. And I, you know, ran around the block a couple of times and it was really intriguing. If I could go around the block once, I wonder if I can go around twice mm. and if, can I maybe go around three blocks and it just kept going. And I quickly realized that um, yeah, tennis was not my game, but long distance running I had a, a a passion for it and an aptitude for it. Like I, I could do it and okay. um, it became, and it still is a very, very important part of my life. What was the, like the moment where you really, so you started running and that was cool, mm -hmm. but there was, did something else like really cause you to bite down? Did you join a club? Did you meet somebody? Did you go to a race? And then you're like, okay, I'm hooked now. What happened? Yeah, there? sure. So my story is, probably the same as just about everybody i'm out running around by myself becoming more and more interested and more enthusiastic about it and then of course i met some people in my wow. town uh there was a group of guys there in santa maria who were a little bit older than me much more talented than me more experienced and they were doing the kind of things that i wanted to do and i knew yeah. that if i hung out with them wow. uh things would be great and and sure enough they had the resources and the ability to go to races uh outside of our town so i followed them around and just became hooked okay what what uh did, had you done a marathon by the time you met these guys or no 
Yeah, my brother-in-law in the 80s had said to me, let's go run the Los Angeles Marathon, the city of Los Angeles Marathon. And you hadn't and, done one before uh -uh, that. I, okay. No, and I, I, and I didn't know really what that was. And I, can, I remember, Steve, that back then, this was probably like 84, 85, something like that, that we went down to the local sporting goods store and at the cash register, there was a paper application for the city of Los Angeles marathon. I remember filling out a paper application, <laughs> putting a check in an envelope and mailing it. And um, then, you know, I guess a couple of weeks later or so, some sort of a response came back and they said, okay, you're in the race with instructions. So we went down and ran that race and it was a horrible experience for me. I ran oh, really like four yeah. hours and six minutes, which is really slow and long and painful and I just knew that I would never do that again. Like, no <laughs> way, no way I'm going to do that again. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. But after a little while, what happens is you start thinking, well, if I change this or change that, mm -hmm. uh, I could have a better experience. And then, Steve, I think I went and ran that race probably 11 more times consecutively, like every single year. How about and that? Wow, it's a, pretty that good. story is pretty typical. That's how most people fall into this stuff. Now, when you're doing this running, was your wife, does she run with you? Or she's like, no, that's your thing. I got my thing or. <laughs> yeah. At the time, like I said, we have three children. So she was very involved with our kids. Yeah. And so selfishly, I was <laughs> really directing a lot of time and energy towards this. And so if you're a distance runner, you're listening to this, you know, you know what I'm about to say. You want to balance your life. You can't be completely uh, immersed in the running community if, if you have a family and a job. Mm -hmm. So you need to find some balance. It's very, very important. So, uh, no. Did she run with me? No. Did she travel with me? Yeah, sometimes. And okay. uh, All know, right. now we have a little running business and she's deeply involved. Yeah. Okay. So now let, that's perfect transition. Let's talk about it. What? Before you tell me about the business, though, to define, define for the listeners, what does long distance running mean? Like, do I, it, that's not marathons. You're talking about longer than marathons, right? Can you mm -hmm. give me kind of the what's the definition? Miles. Yeah. So the 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 typical definition is uh, a marathon is a, is a distance. It's a standard distance. So in the running world, if somebody says marathon, you know they're they're talking about. 26.2 miles so 26 right. miles is a marathon and then anything longer than that is referred to as an ultra marathon so like a 50 kilometers is the next step 50 okay. kilometers is 31 miles and then 50 miles and 100 kilometers and 100 miles and on and on and on so 26 miles is a standard marathon anything longer than that would be considered an ultra marathon okay that, that okay. is the community that I am part of. When did you do your first 100 mile run? Uh, and can you tell me about that experience and mm -hmm. give us a little details? Like, is this like over two days? Is this like I run and I never stop? I take breaks. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the first one, if you don't mind. And well, how my, it works. My, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, like I said, I'd done quite a few street marathons in the okay. 80s a lot. Right. All and right. then I sort of graduated to the dirt in 1990. I found this event in Santa Barbara called the Santa Barbara nine trails, 35 mile endurance run. Okay. So it was a 35 miler in the mountains in Santa Barbara. Like super hard. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot, a lot yep. of texture, 11,000 foot of vertical gain. So it's, Ooh. it's a, it's a legitimate yep. trail run. So I did that in 1990 and that was my first step in okay. long distance running mm -hmm. and racing and i fell in love with that event and i'm still connected to that event very deeply can you do that whole thing without stopping just so i just so i understand or do you have to like stop and take breaks how does that work in the perfect world an advanced elite athlete can cover that 35 miles without stopping and running almost every step at my age now, 60 years old, um, <laughs> it'll take me a while to cover that 35 miles, but I could do it. When you say stop, yeah, you 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 I, will hike up hills, I shuffle see. down hills, but stop, get in a car, go to a hotel, have a nap, <laughs> take a shower and come back. No, you don't do that. It's, it's, con it's continuous. So okay. they st start the clock at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. and you run until you're finished. Okay. So it's... I, the idea is it's continuous. You don't leave the race course. 
Is there some sort of a reward at the end or like beers and celebration and champagne? Like, hey, let's hang out because we, we actually did it. Cool. High five. Is there any of that? Yeah, kind of. Uh, the, the, the trail running community, there's, there is some celebration, but that's not the focal point. Okay. Um, most of the people that are involved in this stuff are kind of advanced and they're sort of beyond all of that. And I see. It's a good way to say that. But okay. You know they're they're satisfied with just completing, uh, knowing that they've done something pretty big, yeah. and yeah, there's you know there'll be an award, a, a medal, or some sort of a trophy. Um, oddly, belt buckles are a big thing in the running oh. community, and there's a whole story behind that. Oh, okay, uh, a trophy buckle, but yeah, and it, 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 is there social component to it? Absolutely, finish yeah, a run, I'll, I'll, and yeah. everyone's mm -hmm. hanging out, drinking a beer, and mm -hmm. talking about the day. Absolutely. It's a big part do, of it. Do you have this situation sometimes? I'm sure you've had this where, or, well, let me start with this. Are you concerned about how you place or do you just care about your own time and finishing? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. And no. Um, the One of the beauties about long distance running is everybody's welcome, regardless of their uh, ability level, their experience level. So some people are in it to win it. Okay. And some people are in it just to for the challenge and hopefully to complete it. Okay. So, yeah, the answer is depends on where you are in your career. I'm sure. I'm sure you had some some races over the years where you you get there and you're like, oh fuck, there's Johnny. God damn it, he's gonna he's good. Or there's there's Miles. Holy shit, Miles is here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or instead of. Oh fuck! There's that guy. It's more like oh fuck! There's that guy. Let's oh. go. You know, like <laughs> cool. Uh, you know, uh, there's Steve. Steve and I. We've been okay. we've been going at it. So this is a good day for me because uh. we're, I'm gonna we're gonna work together. But at the end, yeah, I want to finish in front of you. Okay. You know, so All right. so there's cool. that. Uh, I like that. It's a cool it's a cool game because, like yeah. I said, everybody's welcome, and you can come to an event and line up next to a world class athlete. And uh, and you're running buddies from home and, and everybody's in the same race. And at the end okay. of the day, everybody finishes and everybody's buckle is just as shiny. So <laughs> it's it's a very, very cool environment. All right. Um, before we talk about all we do is run. I want to mm -hmm. tell you a quick, 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 funny story. So I used to run quite a bit. I was never like a long distance guy, but running a few miles a day was a part of my life for a long time. Now I still do treadmill in the morning, but <clears throat> I'm walking. I don't run anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, at one time I did this 5k race and I was there with some friends and everything and we finish and you go to the little tent and everybody's kind of standing around and they have like some snacks or some drinks or whatever. And we're standing around, you know, just talking and a lady comes up to me. She says, are you Steve Urban? And I said, yes. She goes, congratulations. You got first place in your age division. And I was like, uh -huh. oh, cool. And she puts this, she puts this ribbon around my neck and everything. And I go, well, how many people were in my, my age group? She goes, well, just one. <laughs> <laughs> it was my friend, my buddy was standing by me. He just, I mean, it was, he just busted out laughing. It was hilarious. Cause there for like a, a few seconds, I thought, oh, wow, I'm, I won something. She's like, no, 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 you're the only one in the group. <laughs> Steve, but, but, but you did win something because even though you were the only one in the group, you were the only one in the group. Where in the hell was everybody else? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, they were at home or they were, you know, they didn't have the courage or the ability to get themselves there. You got there. there you, you go. You, Thank you. Thank the, you, Luis. The, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we have in the running community too, we have an award called DFL, dead fucking last. So the last person that finishes a race, we celebrate that person. And oh. you, you, you could say, oh, that guy just lost. Maybe. Or... Maybe he didn't because or, or she didn't because where in hell is everybody else? Or, a maybe a hundred people started this run and 70 finished. And that last guy, number 70 is still there. Where's those Ooh, other 30 that's people? Good. That's good. So, that's good. Yeah. So being DFL dead fucking last is on it. I think it's a position <laughs> it's, of honor. It, it's, it's, so good. it's dedication and commitment. And I'm going to finish this thing no matter what, no matter where I'm at. Now I hadn't thought I hadn't thought about that, but I guess yeah, if you're doing a hundred mile race, 
yeah, not everybody finishes. So what is it, about thirty, about twenty, thirty percent fall it, out? It, What's it? It depends on the race course, but not everybody finishes. Yeah, gotcha. and in fact, a lot of people don't finish. Yeah, and that's cool too. I mean, they 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 got yeah, there. They, tried. <laughs> they started and and they went as far as they could go that day yeah. and they learned something maybe they may only went 15 miles out of 100 that's okay i mean it's not the day that they wanted but they learned something and whatever they did again that shit sandwich came and <laughs> like okay oh this is what happens okay uh, next time i'm gonna do this or that and make it better so and so your award first at your age group and there was only one person good for you <laughs> how did you come up with all we do is run. Give us the kind of how it formulated in your mind, how it started. And by the way, for the listeners, it's all we do is run.com. Yeah. How did how did you come up with this? Tell us about the beginning for this thing. I'm just passionate distance runner, been involved for since the 80s. And that race I was telling you about, the Santa Barbara Nine Trails, the 35 mile or my first long race. Um, I, I became obsessed with that too. And I went back year after year, after year, after year, and I learned a lot about the event and, and I helped a little bit with the, uh, okay. production of it. Ultimately the lady that owned that race at the time, she couldn't do it anymore. And she asked if I would, if I would take it over. And that was a big moment for me. Mm -hmm. I was already involved with some other races, the, the production of some other smaller races, but now essentially this lady her name is patsy handed me this beautiful event and is there um, like an ownership can i just pause you right there is there like a is it like an llc is it like a how does that what do you when you when you say handed is it like um it's a real business that's filed with the state and she's like here's the business or she you bought it from her how does that work so yeah there's different levels of uh of, i what the, what the right term would be professional legality for it for okay. a race Okay. Some, you know, it could just be a community race. It, it could just be a group run. It could just be Steve and his buddies are going to go run 10 yeah. miles. And, and every yeah. year at Christmas time, you guys run 10 miles. Okay. But in this that. case, but in this case, it, it's actually an event it, that people it, are paying for. Yeah. Yeah. And it was definitely an event that people were signing up and paying for at okay. the time. Okay. But it was pretty informal. It was pretty much just Patsy's running friends. Right. Okay. And so when i had the the opportunity to manage the race then i was just trying to build it and take it to the next level and okay. then do the things that you talked about uh, getting permits it is uh, an llc getting insurance mm -hmm. making it an actual safe legal yeah. Yeah. permitted business and and, and then, profitable or like break even like by the time you i mean does it make money or is it like okay if i can just make enough here to cover my costs yes and again yes and yes some some races are designed to uh to make money and okay. some are designed to just be community events so it's everything in right. between and all, right. all we do is run at the moment i think there's six races in our group and not all of them are profitable mm -hmm. and it's that's not always the goal it should be i'm not a I great mean, business got... person i'm on yeah. a business podcast telling you i'm not a great business person but, <laughs> uh, and and i could talk about that too because there's reasons but uh, yeah, if you're doing it correctly, all of the bills are paid and there's something left over. Okay, so she, yeah, and I got you off track. Okay, so got you off track. She gives you this first race, mm -hmm. you take it over, you start putting formal stuff in, right? You start, you start like, okay, you start like making it a business, totally. basically. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and, and then it, what, and then where you're like, okay, we got a brand in this thing, like, oh, I want to add another race, now we need a brand. So, or yeah, what happened? Then, then what happened with that event is that, uh, it's in a place that's often impacted by wildfires oh, and um, okay. debris flows. And okay. there's a lot of stuff that happens in those mountains. So one year we had to cancel the event because of fire. Mm -hmm. And so that inspired me. Well, I'll just create a different event in a different part of the forest. And now suddenly we have two races okay. and, 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 and those two are kind of successful. And then, Oh, let's create another one. Then, so on and so on. And so now we're at the point where I think we have six or seven active events under the all we do is run. Okay. Brand. How did you come up with all we do is run? Why, why that name? How did you get that? Why did you decide to brand it that way? 
totally stole that off of a bumper sticker i saw like in ensenada mexico sometime. <laughs> i saw this bumper sticker that said all we do is surf oh. all we all we do is surf.com we're at some right. surf beach or something and i yeah. thought yeah all we all do right. is run That's and then you checked do. you went to you went to godaddy to see if the url was available and boom you grabbed it exactly <laughs> and, i love and, it, 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 it Exactly. So that's it. All we do is run has been around since, I don't know, the early 2000s. And six and there are six current events. And are those annual events or more than once a year? How does that work? It's fluid. But the idea is to get your event established on a weekend and do it every every year. There's a lot of running events all over. And so it's hard to find a vacant weekend. Um but yeah, the idea is that the Born to Run Ultra Marathon happens in the third week of May every single year. And 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 the, and the Santa Barbara Nine Trails event happens the, the third week of March every single year. That's the idea. Okay. Okay. And are, do you want to expand it? Or what is your goal? Is your goal to add more races in California, add more races throughout other states? What's the what's the plan there? My goal in life. Steve is to create opportunities for other people. Mm. And so if I can use these events and my experiences to build, to create more races and create more opportunity for the people around me, that's what I want to do. Not just for the running community, like, like people that sign up for races and run, but for the people that help us manage the races. Mm. If I can, mm. if, if adding another race helps the people around me, that's what I want to do. The reality is me personally, physically, I can't be at everything. Right. And so we can only yeah. have so much that I can right. manage on my own. So mm -hmm. it's important not to spread myself too thin. Yeah. And so do I want to add more races? Sure. If it makes sense for me gotcha. and the people around me. Um, let me ask you this. When you do an event, what do you bring in some some people you know and just like you pay them ten ninety nine for like okay just come help with the event and I'll pay you this much money to run this little booth or whatever. Yes, pretty much. So we don't have employees necessarily. Right. We have right. contractors, and the contractors are our friends that have been volunteering at events for years. And now it's like, okay, we need to step this up. Instead of just being a volunteer, we need you to really focus on coordinating volunteers okay. and so your focus is volunteer coordination and then so yeah we can um yeah. compensate them for their time okay i would think there's a lot involved i mean the location the time the date the weather the the volunteers the booths the food the snacks the drinks the, the, the ribbons up just i don't know i mean I, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot more than people might realize to get ready for one of these things sure you come to an event as a participant and you see the race director uh yeah they're standing around drinking a beer talking to people and you think well hell this is i can <laughs> i can do that um but that's 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 not the reality of what's right. happening so there's right. there's months and months and months of preparation and planning mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of communication with all the different agencies property owners all of that oh, yeah. um and then purchasing all the things that you mentioned so food supplies mm -hmm. uh awards t-shirts all of that and then maintaining the infrastructures we have a lot of stuff uh that that, that that's required to put on an event tables yeah. chairs tents yeah, yeah. Uh, stoves you know all, all of that kind of yeah there's the a, hardware. Lot of, a lot of coordinating there for sure is that uh does that keep you like is that 50 percent of your time and then your photography work is the other 50 percent like how's how's luisa's life balanced there you running both there. yeah I, I am we've probably transitioned to more like a third of my life is behind a camera at this point okay. and then the other two thirds is is being at an event managing an event in addition to all we do is run, I also am a contracted race director for other events. So oh, okay. let's say that you, Steve, let's, let's say I that Rider Flex, Rider Flex wants to put on a a half marathon. Well, I you don't see. want to do it, but you gotcha. want. So then you would find somebody like me and just say, hey, let's do this thing together. Oh, We're going to own sure. the race, but you're going to manage it. See, that would be, yeah, that would be great because you know exactly what to do. You know how to set it up. I just be like, hey, Luis will take care of it. Exactly. Ah, very good. Okay. Do you run that just from a business perspective? Do you run all that under one umbrella LLC or do you, when you contract out, do you run it back to all we do? I'm curious how you have that set up from a business entity. 
So for the other companies that I work for, I'm just uh, a contractor. Yeah. So um, I'm that's just paid, okay. paid that way. Okay. I work for a company called Spartan, Spartan Race, which is a very, very large endurance company. It's one of the largest endurance companies in the world. Okay. And they do obstacle course racing all over. And one of the products that they have is trail running. And, and that's where I come in. I help them manage some of their events. Okay. Uh, very good. That's I, I love it. Do you have, so you said no employees. So all we do is run is you and your wife, and then you use contractors for the event, basically. Yes. That, okay. Exactly. It's as okay. simple as it can be, Steve. It's not very okay. complex. Okay. Are you selling any, any merchandise, any hats, t-shirts, anything cool? You, any Anything you guys are selling? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. of course. Um, and so we have um, products that people can purchase at the events. How about online? Then, mm -hmm, we have an online store at all we do is run.com. Oh, you, we so, do. Okay. So you go to the website. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the website. There is a store there. Oh, I see. There is a cart button and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. If somebody wants to get in touch with you to manage their event, do they go to all we do is run or how do they, how do they contact you for that? Sure. That's a great way. Just all we do is run.com or just send me an email, Lewis Escobar, the number one five zero at gmail.com. And uh, we can talk about it. Okay. All we do is run the business. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, it's making money. I mean, it's, 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 it's paying, is it paying you a salary and kicking off a little bit of profit or like, how's it doing as a, as a business model? Yeah, Steve, it is. So like I said, it's, it occupies about two thirds of my life. So it, uh, it better it make has, some money. It, it better make some money. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, we don't eat. So yes. <laughs> Are any of your kid, children involved or no? No, um, they are definitely aware. And uh, Steve, I have my wife and I have made a real strong effort to um, direct our children to uh, real jobs. <laughs> not to say what I do is not a real job, but being self-employed, self-employed and unemployed, Steve are very close cousins sometimes. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> line. <laughs> I'm going to use that one. That's a great one. <laughs> so uh, at this point, anyway, our kids are doing great. They have traditional educations and traditional employment. And yeah, they're they're not involved with the business right now. Uh, you know, it does take a special uh, type of person to run their own little business, right? And it is, it's, you know, we're joking around about it, but the reality is it is kind of scary and lumpy and curvy. I mean, you know, you... You wake up one day and you're like, wow, I love the fact that we run our own little business. And you wake up other days, you're like, oh, fuck, you know, maybe mm. you just working at Home Depot would be a lot easier. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. To have a reliable paycheck coming uh, yeah, on right. a regular basis is not something I've ever experienced, but it seems pretty cool. But on the other <laughs> hand, I have the ability to uh, live. See, bingo. You know, my, my, my lifestyle is directly related to my ability to work and work hard and you know, things are good. Things are good. You know, Steve. it's a, yeah, there's a trade-off there, right? There's a trade-off. Uh, this uh, Memorial day weekend, I went, I left on Friday morning, went up to the mountains and uh, you know, camped for two or three nights by myself and just got away. And you know, the freedom of being able to just take off on a Friday, whenever I want, without having to ask somebody, without having to ask a boss or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of, uh, personal value in that for me however it's also scary running your own business right so it's a trade-off right uh, it, it depends on what you can live with or what you can handle emotionally i think uh, not everybody can do it not, a lot of people just they want their steady paycheck they want you know their monday through friday yeah i have a friend who owns a business and he always tells me eat what you kill and i you know i like that idea of you know i am <laughs> I am self-employed, but, and I don't say that I don't have a boss. I have a lot of bosses. I have right. thousands of bosses. <laughs> and so it's important for me to be in close communication with all of those people as, you know, when they need to talk, they need an answer. I need to be available to respond. And that's the biggest part of my job. So the, the running and the photography, that's just the, the vehicle. Um, who, who manages the, your, who, who does marketing and social media for you? Steve, I do it all by myself. So it's not very good because it's just me. So yeah. the websites, the, uh, the, all the social media channels, that's me. 
So I am the, the moment I wake up, I am I'm involved with with that till the moment I go to bed. I am try to be in contact with our audience all okay. the time. Now, but you only have Facebook and Instagram, is that right? Or fa Facebook and what are you, what are you doing? That what are your channels? Facebook and Instagram. We have a couple of different Facebook pages, different groups. Okay. But yeah, that's it. I use I use a uh, constant contact as a mail um, platform to communicate okay. with folks through okay. that. Um, it's pretty simple, Steve. And then just direct email. I my email boxes are full all of the time, and I'm happy to to interact with people. Are you doing a podcast as well? Oh yeah, so the Road Dog Podcast. Road Dog Podcast. I'm looking Road at Road Dog it right Podcast now. Adventures. Like it. <laughs> it's casual conversation with just people that I meet. Awesome. Um, it's it's kind of a cool story, Steve. When um when COVID started in March 2000, I realized very quickly that everything that I do. Uh, depends on large groups of people everything my photography work mm -hmm. of course the production work and like all of a sudden in march everything stops mm. uh, like that was the, that was like okay oh shit now what mm -hmm. i'm gonna lose contact with everybody and everything mm -hmm. so i had always had this idea like maybe i could you know, i'm a photographer i'm a storyteller so maybe i could transfer that into audio maybe i could do mm -hmm. audio portraits like just little in interviews, conversations with the people around me. And yep. this is a way that I can keep in contact with, with our audience. So I hired a producer, smartest thing I ever did. Kevin Lyons up in Seattle, Washington. Huh? Okay. He, he is the producer. Him and I are partners in the road dog podcast. And that's a separate our, business that you filed. That's a separate. separate. Okay. Separate. Yep. And that is, that is our business together, Kevin and I. Okay. So I thought uh, I'll just do this interviews until this COVID is over. So it just be a couple of weeks and, you know, whatever. <laughs> well, we've been going at it. I mean, it, it kind of caught on. And so we publish every single Monday. Love we've it. Only miss one or two since uh, April, 2020. Okay. Uh, and it's still happening. What do you have? Like 200, almost 300 uh, episodes. Where are you at? Well, uh, Two, 250? Yeah, something like that. yeah, something like that. No, oh, that's nice. And are they, uh, how long is each episode? Hour, hour and a half? What are you doing there? Yeah, it just depends on the on the guest. And it, they're all guest-based. And uh, yeah, it's uh, my goal is an hour, but sometimes they go into an hour and a half, maybe even two hours, but somewhere right around there. Now, I noticed looking at the podcast, uh, nice job of setting it up to hopefully make some money, right? I think, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's, I mean- I have not done that with Rider Flex yet. I should. I need to talk to your. I need to talk to your guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you can uh, like it's very clearly like, hey, become a Patreon subscriber. You know, uh, right. is it is it making you any money or is it just trickling like a little bit of cash here and there? Or is what's what's it doing? The the idea was never to make money from yeah. the podcast. It's the hard idea, to. Very, very the hard idea to. was yeah to use it to help stay connected with yeah good with our business audience. You know, our yeah. running yeah. community. And so uh, we use it to to feature and showcase some of the the companies that support our running events, uh -huh. and then use it as a way to create awareness about our running events. Maybe there's some future sponsorship in there from some of those companies. Hopefully, exactly. But really, it's listener supported. So okay. the Patreon subscribers, we have over a hundred people that make a small financial contribution each month, okay. as little as five dollars a month, and uh, some people as much as twenty five dollars a month. So it's not a money maker, Steve, but it does help Kevin yeah. and I, yeah. um, you know, cover our time. It does take, as you know, it takes a oh. lot of time to produce <laughs> yeah. a show. Oh yeah. That, that's the that's the one thing people way underestimate people they'll call me up and be like oh, i'm gonna start a podcast and i'm like okay good luck mm -hmm. because it takes a shit ton of time <laughs> yeah again it's the same thing like you come to a running event the race director's just standing around drinking a beer you think oh shit i i, I can do that you listen to a podcast and yeah right he's just just talking to folks and, yeah, uh, and that's it <laughs> that's not how that's not what that's it is. not how it goes uh <laughs> on yours the way yours is set up so you can't I can't listen to you on Spotify or YouTube or anything. I have to. Have... All of that. All of that. It's on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, oh. all of those things. But what's so, the, but, but uh, how does it, oh, the Patreon is basically doesn't get you anything special. It just is a way to contribute. 
that's it. Those are just I, people I, that I, see value in what I we're see, doing, Steve. You can listen to the show for free. No problem. Uh, but more okay. than a hundred people say, you know what, Lewis, we're going to, I'm going to give you $5. Okay, month. cool. And that's I think it. The, I might, you know, maybe we need to do that too. I'm not, like you said, it is very difficult to make money off of a podcast because fucking everybody has a podcast. It mm -hmm. seems like, right. But Hey, if you, if he kicks off $400 a month, okay, great. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. And again, nobody has to pay. And, and, and every week I ask them, Hey, you guys help us out. Subscribe to the show. Go to patreon.com yeah. forward slash road dog podcast, become a subscriber. Um, a, a, a good friend or another podcast host, uh, Scotty uh, Coomer. He has a, a podcast called 10 junk miles. He says it like this. If you ran into Lewis at Starbucks and you were going to sit down and, and talk for a half an hour, would you buy him a cup of coffee? Ooh, would you, that's a good would one. you, you know, and the answer is like, yeah, of course. Yeah, if I true. saw Steve and we're going to sit down and have a cup of coffee, yeah. of course it's $5. What, what's the big deal? So that's his mentality. Just, okay. just tell these people, listen, let's get together once a week, $5 a month to hang out and just chat. I love it. Come on. And yeah, so man. that's, that's our attitude towards it. Very good. I love it. I love it, bro. Um, and you're almost 60 by the way, and you sound and feel and look like you're, you know, 49. I am not almost 60. I am 60 <laughs> years old and, uh, I feel like I'm 60. Years. Some days, some mornings, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. It's uh yeah. Good morning. I'm getting I'm getting old. There you go. What are you going to do? Roaddogpodcast.com. Mm -hmm. be, sure be sure to check that out and allwedoisrun.com. Mm -hmm. Uh plus you can also uh contact Luis for the photography work as well. Uh mm -hmm. and what's that website again for the photography? Well, Reflections work? Reflections Photography Studio is our our old address for our portrait business. But uh, the way to get a hold of me is just send me an email, Lewis Escobar, the number 150 at gmail.com. Okay. All right, sir. Interesting life and very uh, authentic and inspiring because you've basically, you, you've had the balls to create your own business in several different ways through the photography and through the running. And you tied both of those businesses to your passions, what you love to do, and created this wonderful life for yourself. Congratulations. Yeah, let me say this. It sounds like we're about ready to close this. Let me let me kind of finish with this. And this is important. And anybody that knows me hears me say this over and over and over again. But it's important. And it is uh, it is the secret to whatever success that I might have. And in 2006, I was invited to go to Mexico and be part of this running adventure. That adventure later became a book. Christopher McDougall was on this trip and he wrote this book called Born to Run. Mm -hmm. And Born to Run became a best-selling book in the running community and beyond. I was on this original trip down to Mexico to run with these Tarahumara Indians and read the book and you'll understand what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. But during that trip, I met this guy who's the central figure in the book. His name is Micah True. And as corny as this is going to sound, this is the secret to everything. Uh, Micah and I were in Mexico. We were having dinner together and just talking, just like you and I are talking right now, Steve. And we talked about life and business and life. Mm -hmm. And he told me that the greatest gift that we have to share with one another, it's not money and it's not things. It's the gift of opportunity, give somebody a chance. Mm -hmm. With whatever resources that you might have, great or small, you have something to offer. And what you have is the ability to give somebody a chance to create opportunity. And mm -hmm. that's it, man. That's from that Love moment it. till right now, all of these years later, that's how I run my whole show. Everything that I do is based on the idea of creating opportunities for other people. Very and nice, sir. Very you nice. Do, you, you do that, Steve, and good things are going to happen to you, to the people around you. That's how Luis, you do it. Luis, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you sharing your story on the Rider Flex podcast, man. Congratulations on everything. Thanks for having me. Good to be <laughs>